Thanks so much for coming to my session, Top 10 Mistakes New IT Leaders Make. And um, I often get slated for this time slot, uh, either you know the first, second, or third day of the week, because a lot of us as IT people recognize that we need to focus on the hard technology things. And by the end of the day, we need a nap. So <laughs> thank you for coming. I know what's motivating you, right? <laughs> um, so how many of us have experienced a really bad leader somewhere in our past? Any of us? Some of you are not putting your hands down. You're like, I've always been the leader. It's like, mm, maybe, that's, maybe that's telling us something, right? Um, yeah, we've all, that, actually in you know, interpersonal situations, that's where I learn the most is what I don't want to be like. I don't want to be like that. Um, and so hopefully you can learn from some of these mistakes. The bad news for me is I was reviewing the slides a little bit earlier this afternoon so that I realized I've made every one of these mistakes in the last two weeks. So, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> I need to get a little bit better about this. Um, of course, here's the boilerplate. Please silence your cell phone. If your cell phone do does go off, don't jump up like it just scared the crap out of you. Don't do that. Because I have seen that happen too. Someone uh, at lunch, someone had their phone go off and they reached up to grab it real quick and their hand was under the table. So they pow! All the glasses jumped. All of us just about screamed and wet ourselves. So, uh, right? Also, here's one of the things I always encourage people. You know, pass is not a single event. A lot of people, and you'll even see complaints that show that people think of PASS as a conference, like a tech ed or something like that. PASS is not. PASS is a corollary in our industry to what doctors have in the American Medical Association. Right? This is a not-for-profit association that has chapter meetings on a local level. Do get involved in your local activities, in other PASS activities like the 24 Hours of PASS, SQL Saturday events. Anyone been to a SQL Saturday? All right, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, ask the, these folks that have been, and they'll tell you this is a great, a great way to spend a Saturday. And it's free. It, you know, usually you pay $10 for lunch, but if you really don't want to pay $10, you can skip lunch, right? One thing I encourage people who attend, especially if you're new to PASS or maybe you haven't done this in the past, even if you have to do it out of pocket and your corp the company you work for, the organization you work for, doesn't pay for the session recordings, buy them yourself, okay? Is there any time slot in the day where you've had less than two sessions you'd like to see? Anyone? I mean, I look at that and I'm like, I'd like to go to four of these six, you know? Um, and here's, here's the thing, though, and this, it's a, I actually touch on this later on in the slides. There are certain times, there are certain people, there are certain roles that are the only ones in that spot that can do what needs to be done. Okay? You can only talk to many of your peers here throughout the year. Right? So if you're having a great discussion with someone and you're like, wow, I'm solving problems because they solved problems in the past that I'm having now, stay and have that conversation and skip the session. Right? Because you can listen to that someday over lunch. Okay? So this is a really, really powerful way to amplify what it means to be in a professional association. The, you know, the surface power of an event like this is coming and seeing sessions, right? But the real power is meeting people who know how to solve your problems. That's where the real power is. So leverage that, amplify it, make it easier to do that. You can only do that here by buying these uh, the session recordings. And then you can listen to them throughout the year at your desk while you have a a Blimpy sub. Is Blimpy still in business? I, I don't know. Uh, oh, you have a sandwich, right? Okay. So that's the boilerplate. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I was actually one of the founders of this organization, of PASS. And uh, uh, the whole reason I uh, agreed to sign up was because they told me I could come to the, the conference for free. So I don't want you to think I'm uh, more ethical or upstanding than I really am. I was totally mercenary. I'm like, getting into the conference for free, yeah. Uh, um, and I was president for four years back in the, uh, in, the, in the 2000s. We called it the hard, 
days, right? Uh, we didn't have money. We didn't ha have. Uh, we didn't have a lot of things that I see now that I'm just so impressed with. Anybody come to a conference in the 2000s, a past conference? Right. Oh, representing from my peeps, yeah. <laughs> Excellent, glad to see you here. You probably remember when we, uh, uh, we were thankful to get the bag that everyone's complaining about today. <laughs> we had to walk uphill both ways to get a bag like that. Um, so I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn at K.E. Klein. I hope you'll follow me there um, and connect with me. Um, my blog is at uh, my company site, blogs.sequelcentury.com slash Kevin Klein. Uh, email, kekline at sequelcentury.com. I also have a whole bunch of other slides. I think I have six or seven slide decks at slideshare.net. And by spring of next year, I'll have posted most of my slide library, which will be on order of 23 or 24 different slide decks. Um, I've been doing this for a while, so a lot of stuff up there. Um, all right, so let's talk about leadership. I'm best known, you know, in the technical sense. I was the author of a book called Sequel in a Nutshell, uh, which peaked at number 23 on Amazon at one time. I mean, of all books in, in, the, in the 90s. But I spent a lot of time working on leadership topics and uh, kind of building our professional skills, you know, the P uh, part of pass. So if you take the P out of it, what have you got, right? Um, so, uh, all right, the, that one didn't work very well. Okay, um, so the pro, you know professionalism, right? Uh, I I find, and tell me if if you're finding something different. I find that technology projects go off the rails not because of technology, it's because of people, right? Somewhere we messed up. We didn't communicate. We didn't do something right, and so. You know, leadership is one very, very critical element of that. Where is it all going wrong? What is it that caused us to not be able to accomplish this particular project or for this team not to be effective? And, you know, in a, in a circumstance like that, it's, um, it's a lot of things. Many times, it's, it's just a fundamental misunderstanding of what effective leadership is, okay, of, of how to properly how to properly do it, you know, how to, how to properly um, uh, motivate people. And one of the things I learned is I tried to do a better job of that is, uh, well, well, we'll not get the cart in front of the horse. I'll tell you a little bit more about, about that in a moment. What we are going to talk about just as a, as a quick roadmap for our session, one very important thing that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, which could be a whole day session if we had the time. So something that's not on the list. Then we're going to go through 10 very prescriptive things, if you are in a position of leadership, that can help you become much more effective and avoid some of the hard knocks that, uh, that I have experienced trying to be a leader um, and trying to do it honestly and effectively. And then we're going to you know, wrap up. We'll have time for questions. That's the last session of the afternoon, I believe, right? No? All right, never mind. I was going to say, I'll stick around as long as you want, but clearly I won't. Um, but you also have my email address. I have a whole stack of cards. So if we don't have time for your questions, then we will, um, uh, I'll be happy to answer those offline, okay? Or after hours. All right. So one of the key things that we find happening over and over again for technologists, and you'll also see me use the word occasion, or a phrase occasionally called individual contributors, an IC, right? So uh, maybe we're a, a dev or a DBA or we're uh, an administrator or something else. How many of us here are DBAs primarily in our job? Okay, about a quarter. How many of us are uh, dev types? We do development stuff. Ooh, okay, more than another quarter. A lot of you didn't raise your hands. Um, Anyone here on the BI side? Oh, that's most of us. Anyone here already a manager? Or you don't do anything? Like, I like this. <laughs> Just saying. Um, so one of the things that happens so often is there's, uh, you know, uh, we get promotions. We're skilled. We're capable. People are like, wow, you're really sharp. Have you thought about becoming the team lead? Or, or conversely, in my own case, uh, you know, I. Um, I topped out in my pay grade. I used to work for the, um, uh, I used to work for NASA, and for uh, later after that, I worked for the 
uh, U.S. Army Missile Command, and they have very stratified pay scales, right? And to, to get to the, uh, to go from a GS-13 to a GS-14, you have to manage people. I mean, that's just the way it is. You climb a ladder, and if you want to go any further, you have to manage people. And, uh, and so all these things that made me really successful as a, um, uh, as an individual contributor. I got my first job at NASA because I was both really good at SQL, which was a brand new language, and I was really good at Fortran. So just dating myself there a little bit. I could wrap SQL statements in Fortran. Whoa, that's totally cool, <laughs> radical, uh, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, Back to the Future was playing at that time. Um, but, uh, you know, so I was really good at that. Was I any good as a leader? Not really, but that's what I got my promotions based on was all my tech. So here I am going into a job in which a Venn diagram of everything that it takes to make me successful as a leader is this part of the circle. And everything that has made me successful in the past is in this circle. And the overlap is like 2%, right? And so some of us love technology. We're great at it. And here we are. We get promoted. And everything that we've done up to now that set the benchmark is no longer valid, right? One of the things that I learned kind of by accident, maybe our clicker will work, and which I lacked at the time, was a strong sense of self-awareness. Okay? I didn't really know at that time uh, that just because I was smart and good at some things would also imply that I was not smart and good at other things. Anyone been to like a family reunion and that one uncle who sells insurance and is the most successful of all the other uncles thinks he can tell you about how to raise your kids, you know, and like why you're wrong about politics and stuff like that. And you're like, I would just really like you to be quiet, you know. I just want to eat my turkey. It's Thanksgiving, right? I was kind of that guy at the time. Like, I'm super good at code, right? So I'm smart and I know what to do and I'm totally lacking in self-awareness, right? Uh, and now, it could be that, you know, you're, you, ha you come to that from a different place, but one of the things that we find when we look at really high performance teams, so think about sports teams, for example. If you want to play on a, you know, high-end team, you've got to be good at, you've got to be a specialist, right? And, uh, you know, so if you're playing on a baseball team and you're a hitter, do you go out and practice, like, sprinting? day in, day out, I mean, is that, that's not the way it works. What happens is when you have some self-awareness, you actually spend your time working to make your strengths even stronger, okay? You don't spend all your time making where you're mediocre or weak, uh, making them good. Uh, why is that? Well, what happens is if you know what you're good at and you really work on that and you're in a team environment, you can get other people on the team who are good at other things. And then suddenly everybody is good, right? The other thing too is that the, the research around performance, it teaches us that if you're exceptionally good at something and you work, or I'm sorry, if you're really good, naturally good at something and you work hard on becoming A++, top tier at that particular skill set, you will double or triple your productivity. But if you're mediocre, and you're not inspired by it, and it doesn't interest you, and you work really hard on it, it's additive. You might get 20% better or 30% better. But if you're really good at something and, you work, and you're inspired by it and you work hard on it, you'll get 200%, 300% better, right? So I've seen managers who aren't people persons, right? They don't like public speaking, but they find someone on their team who does enjoy that. And they communicate with them, they talk one-on-one, -on -one, and you know, Cynthia's gonna do the presentation for us about what our strategy is for the next year. And then suddenly the whole team is better, and that leader isn't having to worry about something that they're really bad at, right? And it also brings up the whole team. We can be really successful together as a group. Don't have self-awareness, which I didn't. Uh, I learned that there are some tools. So here's, this is kind of the, the the style that we're going to go through. I'm going to present a mistake or a problem or a challenge, and I'm going to give you some remedies to that as we go along, okay? So if you have never done this before, there are actually uh, several extremely good, they call them psychometric tests, okay? And you could look up free and then the name of any of these tests, and you'll find one that's usually like a 30 or you know, 20 or 30 question version of this. There's the full versions that you typically have to pay a, a leadership trainer or something like that to take you through. And those are really, really good, really powerful, and really effective. 
but you can get free versions of these online. They'll help you figure out who you are, right? The, the tragedy of the pointy-haired boss in Dilbert isn't that he's such a terrible boss. The problem is that he doesn't know he's a terrible boss, right? I've taught a lot of leadership classes over the year, and you know what I hear most frequently from the people who attend my classes? I wish we could get my boss in here, right? And I tell them, the fact that you're in here already puts you in a different category than your pointy-haired boss, because you at least have some self-awareness that I could maybe do this a little bit better, right? So Myers-Briggs is the most sophisticated of those. Very nuanced. First time I took a Myers-Briggs test, I thought they had like bugged my house, because I read what it said a person who has this type is, and it was like, this is exactly me. Guess what the type, the name, they have a little nickname for each type. Guess what my type name was? No? Well, thank you, though. That's a, it was the administrator. I'm like, oh, I'm a DBA. How about that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Wasn't that, I love being a DBA. It's like, yes, you, were, you like to make things orderly and follow rules and you know, set things in, so they're consistent. I'm like, yeah, I was just doing file groups and files just this morning. You know? I was really shocked by that. Um, very, very effective. Um, DISC, uh, each of those uh, letters, it's, it's their initials. So uh, whether you're um, driven or you're inspirational or you're... Um, uh, kind of supportive and so forth. So that kind of talks about how you like to interact with people and so forth. And then Strength Finder. Strength Finder, again, kind of helps you figure out what you're really good at and things that you could leverage and make better uh, in your environment. The, the top one, as I mentioned, is the most sophisticated. DISC is in the middle. Uh, and then Strength Finder is actually kind of almost very different from the other two. If you don't have a lot of time, but you just want to put your toe in the water with this, I would suggest you take a look at DISC, because it's, it's real simple and it's very direct, okay? So self-awareness, get to know yourself a little bit. Think about, uh, you know, have you ever found yourself sitting at a lunch table and everybody's looking at you like, when will you stop talking? You might, oh, I wonder if I'm a little too, uh, too extroverted or, you know, I'm dominating discussions. Think about yourself, right? This is going to change everything compared to the leaders and managers who don't have self-awareness. You're going to be in a different category in terms of promotability and, and that sort of thing. Now, where does it all go wrong? Again, this is a little bit of a cultural discussion. So if you're in areas besides North America, this, it's, it's possible that this won't apply to you. And, it, and we could talk offline uh, a little bit about it if you're in uh, someplace like South America. Southeast Asia or other parts of the world. But typically in the English speaking world and a lot of Western Europe, there's two sorts of approaches to leadership, okay? And then on the one side, we've got autocratic styles of leadership. This is the manager who, who's tough, who's hard to work with a lot of times. They, um, they really kind of own um, their unit, you know, their, their group, their part within the organization. They tell people what to do. Uh, people tend to be afraid to do things other than what they are told to do. Um, they don't really share other things. You know, if another manager starts to do some work in their area, they're the kind of uh, leader that will often get up and say, hey, you stop whatever you're doing. And you wait till I say yes. Or you stop doing it until I do it, right? This is something that we see um, we see it all over the place. Anyone seen the movie? You know the movie I'm about to mention, right? Okay, I'm gonna, gonna need you to come in this weekend. And, or, what's, what's that movie, right? Yeah. Office Space, right? This is a classic, a classic movie, right? Um, so there's a, there's a kind of manager who, by the way they approach things, you can't do it without my permission. You, don't have autonomy. I don't really trust you to do things. In fact, not only that, uh, I, I'm pretty suspicious that you're going to mess it up, so I'm going to tell you how to do everything. Everything, right? And what happens when we have a superior that demands that kind of interaction with us? What happens to that relationship? How much do we give back to them? I leave, yeah, <laughs> I'm out the door. I give them less than nothing. <laughs> Just enough to not get fired. Thank you, you watched that movie, didn't you? That's what he said, I've got eight bosses. All I'm ever trying to do is make sure that none of them want to fire me, 
right? And that's what happens, right? When you have a boss who's all up in your business, you know, you don't, you don't want to do too much. You're going to get, you know, you're going to get your wrist slapped for that or worse. And you also don't really have, uh, you know, positive feelings about them. So you're sure not going to stay late and try and get something done. And the, you know, in your time, because man, they make every minute you're there on their time painful, right? And then we have much more successful model. And the thing that's cool about leadership is that it is really well supported by research. So all of this is extremely empirically proven that there is another model. It's, it's much more common in, in the English speaking uh, world again, in which the leader doesn't necessarily see themselves as an authority put in place to take advantage of all the the principles and privileges that they might have. Now I have expense account and I have a special parking space close to the building and it's all about me. Uh, this is the coaching leader. Uh, when you think about a coach, anyone have kids here? I, I know you Germans won't, won't raise your hand to that one, but um, uh, you know, well, some of us like privacy, okay? Um, but uh, if you have kids, you know, you'll see a coach, to, you know, their soccer team or one of their sports teams. And a lot of times, uh, you know, they're like, all right, I need you to practice your kicks. I need you to do this because that's, you know, that's what our team needs is everybody on this team has to practice our kicks. And uh, once you're out on the field, I'm not going to get out there. Or I'm not going to call you in and say, I need you to stop at the 50 yard line. I need you to turn right. I need you to go five paces. I need you to stop again. And, you know, you don't see that kind of micromanagement. You don't see that sort of, um, and that, you know, that's a natural way for a lot of us to work. Um, it, it feels comfortable for somebody to kind of be in charge of coordinating the effort and working towards a common goal, but it's more a series of encouraging steps along the way, right? And sometimes you'll pull somebody in, you know, a coach like that will say, yeah, you shouldn't kick the other player. Um, I'm going to need you to sit out for a little while, especially the third and the fourth kick. That was a bit too much. Um, you know, so there, it doesn't mean that they don't have authority. It doesn't mean that at all. It means they choose to exercise the authority that they're given in a different sort of way, one that is all about the team, right, all about a shared set of goals. And so I'm going to ask you, how do you feel like you're doing on this particular role? Can you be successful in it? It's not something you've done before. Oh, yeah, I think I can do it. All right, let's give it a try. Um, also, coaching leaders, they don't necessarily build walls and silos between organizations. They often are very network oriented and they find out who their natural allies are. You know, if, if you're constantly getting thwarted in your request for hardware, one of your natural allies might be another team that needs hardware. You know, if the SharePoint team never gets hardware, either. Maybe the two of you together can help each other, right? So they, they share things. They, they focus on building up the team overall, correcting behaviors that aren't effective for the team, but not, not necessarily like an autocrat, you know, pounding down on a nail that sticks up too far. Big difference. It's about us, not about me, okay? Now, having said that, let's dive in to 10 specific problems that people, particularly IT people, and particularly in their first significant leadership role, experience, okay? All right, so the first thing that we see happen a lot, especially in large organizations, is relying on the status quo, okay? Relying on the way we've done things, we've always done things. Uh, an example of that would be um, uh, when I first uh, got a leadership role, um, I hate to say this, but I'm going to talk about a lot of mistakes I've made. I hope you're okay with that. Um, uh, let's say this person named Jim um, <laughs> is newly promoted into a, a leadership role, and the only model he has was his previous manager. Um, in that case, the Tuesday morning status meeting might be a natural response to getting that promotion, right? Because that's what we've always done as a team. We've always had a status meeting on Tuesday. And so what happened for a while in that particular case is everyone would come to the status meeting and behave just like they did under the previous uh, manager in which each person would take a turn talking about all the things that they did in the last week. Sometimes they'd have to kind of pump up a few extra things so that their five or seven minutes of discussion time would actually be filled up, even though they really only worked on one huge problem the whole time. 
And conversely, other people who worked on a dozen different things only had a little bit of time to report their status. Uh, you know, it's the kind of thing where one person would talk and everyone else would take a turn sitting there, right? A friend of mine who is uh, here at the uh, summit, a guy named Buck Woody, uh, he tells a funny story about how um, he had a manager who conducted their status meetings like that, or actually a mutual friend had a status meeting, and the person back before the maker days went and took one of these LED things that can scroll messages across, you know, like, Merry Christmas. And um, he scroll, uh, he, you know, he programmed it, brought it in, and, and set it down, and then the, the senior manager looked, looked up at one point during the meeting and says, why does that say $43,000 and, you know, su such and such? And the guy raises his hand, he says, well, I calculated everybody's I used an average rate of $40 per person sitting in the room, and that's how much time it's costing us this hour to have this meeting uh, in lost productivity because we're just going around giving status. And the guy said, meeting dismissed. <laughs> right. Is it needed? Do we have to do it? Um, if you're going with the status quo, that could be great if the status quo was a really, really well-designed system, right? The processes were really effective and really good. Where does that fail us, though? Is when they haven't changed in a long time, no one's been paying attention to them, we just do it because we do it. And what happens is, I find my life filled with people who are very, very busy and not at all productive, right? How do we reconcile this? What do we do with this? If we ever get into a position where we lead, you want to look at everything you do, particularly as a new leader, when you step into that position, you're kind of given a grace period. And I guess that would be the secret, uh, the secret sauce of this one slide. You have about 90 days in which people are kind of expectantly waiting for you to change things. What's this new manager going to do? How's it going to change? And so the advice typically is to take 60 of those 90 days and look at everything that's going on around you. Now, if you've been working on that team, you probably have already been looking around quite a lot. And hopefully you have a lot of things that you want to do better. Um, but if that's not the case, maybe you get hired into a leadership position in an all-new organization you haven't worked in before. Take a little time. Don't upset the apple cart, so to speak. Figure out how things go. And then come at it as a clean slate. I want to produce these results. What are the processes that I could put in place that would ensure those results happen? but yet make us very productive instead of very busy, right? You can communicate status in a lot of different ways. We don't have to make everybody else take a turn to do that, right? Um, so that can be a really, really effective way to, to lead a team is just to not do things the way they've always been done. Well, how long have we been doing it that way? Well, since the 60s, it's like, whoa. Things are a lot different in the 60s. Now, Another thing that happens is uh, a, a lot of times we will approach things as kind of, I'm the person who has to solve this problem. This is a very American way to do things, right? Uh, it's time to tighten up our belts and sing like the Duke, right? I'm going to go out there, I'm the gunslinger, I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to improve this, but I'm going to shape this place up. Um, one of the things that does happen, though, is that, uh, again, this is a tendency of that autocratic leader. Um, and what the more coaching leader knows is that anytime you have a chance to work through things as a team, then this, this creates a situation where I'm not the bottleneck, I'm also not exhausted, right? If I have to put in a you know, heroic level of effort to, to make something happen for my team, then that means I'm also probably gonna be the most exhausted person. And when I do something, I go out on my own, one of the things that happens is who gets to celebrate that success if it actually works out really well? Just the person who did that work, right? Whereas if you do it as a team, you can praise the team. And there's few things that a team enjoy as much as positive reinforcement that you did something good, okay? Another thing that happens, and this is specific to IT people when we get into leadership positions, is we find out that leadership and management sucks. It's hard. And that extra 4% you got by moving into this position is hella not worth it, right? <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've seen someone tell me, yeah, I got promoted to a manager of the DBA team, and I wish I was just a DBA again. 
right? So one of the really, really bad things that happens is that we retreat back to what we know best, what we were successful about all our career as a DBA. I, you know, one of my good buddies um, did that. He went back to writing T-SQL code and managing servers and stuff like that. And he got into a situation where he was kind of pulled aside by his team. And they're like, what about all these things we've got to get solved? He's like, well, they'll work themselves out. And they're like, well, who's going to do that? He's like, oh, yeah, I guess I'm the person who has to do that. He was the only one empowered to do that and to make those decisions. He was the only person who could do that particular work. And so it was crucial that he step up and get out of his comfort zone and go back into that kind of work talking with other managers, negotiating. He didn't want to negotiate. He, you know, that wasn't his thing. But sometimes you've got to step out of your comfort zone if you want to, if you want to be seen as a leader. Okay. Another thing that we do often, it's not, uh, it's not always true, but um, I'll illustrate it with, with a joke. How, how do you know that, um, that the IT guy really likes you? He's looking at your shoes when he talks to you instead of his own shoes, right? Um, so we, we, do have, we do have this stereotype that uh, we're kind of an introverted sort of people. And uh, so a lot of times we don't reach out the way we could or should, right? Um, in my case, the remedy uh, that helped me come out of my show was twofold. One was to schedule regular, uh, according whatever works best for your team, one-on-one -on -one meetings just to talk. Not about the routine. You know, did you get this done? Did you get that done? But like, what are the challenges you're facing? What are things that I can do to help unblock problems you're having, you know, to help leverage what you need to get your job done? And it might be a 15-minute call. But once you've completed that, you have reinforced the positive nature of your relationship, right? And that uh, it's more than about just checking up on have you done things. It's am I making you successful? Uh, one of the most important things that new leaders learn is that you're no longer judged on your delivery of those individual contributor things. You're judged on the success of your team in aggregate. That was a big revel revelation for me. I was like, what? I'm, I have to worry about that clown over there? Yeah. They're in your team, right? And you are synonymous with your team. All right. Number eight. So. Retreating is, is one facet of this same kind of problem. I found that um, uh, there's another category. So we talked about kind of introverted folks at one time. Another kind of category that I see is uh, extroverted IT people. I'm, I'm one. I'm kind of extroverted. Um, if you don't have that self-awareness, you may dominate a conversation, right? And half of the time, everybody else in the room is thinking, we know how smart you are. You can just, you can stop, you can stop, right? <laughs> you prove your point. Make sure you spend, if you're that extroverted talkative type, make sure you spend more time listening than you do talking. The, the old adage is we have two ears and one mouth, and make sure you keep it in that ratio, right? When you listen, when you ask open-ended questions on that second point there, you actually build trust. It's called the law of reciprocity. It's a, it's a fundamental law of, I guess you could say, of psychiatry, psychology, of how people interact. If you show trust, you're much more likely to get trusted in return. If you show interest in other people, you're much more likely to be considered the most interesting person in that room. Weird, huh? Right? You ask people, who was the best conversationalist at that meeting you had? And it might be the person who listened with the most active and expressive interest, right? who asked the most interesting questions, but really didn't talk very much. All of those things build trust. Okay? So something that happens a lot, especially when we're opening our mouth, is when we're not building trust very much. Okay? Uh, this is a mistake that I make all the time. I'll tell you that right now. I like people. And I will bend over backwards in situations when I probably shouldn't to try and make sure that we stay friends no matter what. But again, when you become the boss, an important thing that you have to learn, it was hard for me to learn, is that there are times when you have to discipline people on your team. Okay? There are times when you have to 
rein in behavior or change, modify people's behavior. And my mistake was to put goodwill, right, friendly kind of camaraderie, ahead of the success of the team. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I saw, I witnessed from someone else, was there was a real kind of prima donna sort of person on our team, exceptionally skilled, and also, you know, had one of these kind of uh, unspoken contracts with a manager that they needed green M&Ms in their, you know, in the green room and, you know, only Diet Coke with honey or, you know, I mean, they were just really, really difficult to work with. And it really said a lot to us that that was tolerated, right? What did it say to those of us, like, this person didn't have kids. So what did it say to us when this person got rewarded for working an 80-hour week and turned in, you know, admittedly exceptional re uh, results, but made all the rest of us feel really crappy about what we did? What did, what did that say as a team? It, well, for one thing, you know, we're not all equally valued, right? How do I win your favor now as a boss? Do I have to do something ridiculously over the top? Um, you know, what's the standards of excellence here? Because I would put forward that our standard of excellence should be in what is a normal work week for an individual, right? So if somebody works way over what's normal, um, and when something is abnormal, it might not be good, even if it produces great results. We want predictability and consistency and things like that uh, in a lot of situations. So, you know, if everybody else on the team is made to be less productive for the sake of one other person, not always good leadership, is it? Right? Some of you are thinking, I'm that per I'm the one who's, who's the great one in the room. So I saw you looking at me like that. Um, so there's, there's a couple mistakes here, like a, trying too hard to be a friend, trying too hard to accommodate someone who's a little bit difficult to work with, but they deliver something that you really need. A lot of times we have to put team success first to make sure that everybody on the team is able to deliver and do all that they can to engender the success of the team, okay? Now this is another one that was uh, surprising for me. And that is um, that culture doesn't just happen, it can just happen. And in fact, if you don't do anything, a team culture will develop with your team. But um, you can also guide it and direct it. So uh, in the early 2000s, I was taking an international trip. And um, coming through the security in this country, not in the USA, you know, not even in um, Western Europe, I saw in the security booth that um, at the airport, there was a picture of a, a, a woman in a bikini, right? Where anybody coming through security could see this. And I thought, where's the leader in this case, right? That permits this to be, to be allowed. What's, what is the culture like for this team uh, when one or more women on this team come to work, right? How can you tolerate that? What you permit, you encourage. So that's kind of an extreme example because we're like, hey, this is America. We're not gonna let that happen. Although, I still see that kind of thing happen. But another kind of less extreme example was I was actually recently in a meeting in which this prima donna that I was talking about on the previous uh, slide, they were this close to like bullying another team member. They were so intellectually above the rest of the people on the team, that person was, that they would just kind of, you know, confound them with all these technology things and really belittle them and make them feel bad. And I looked over at the manager to see when they would say something along the lines of, why don't we take this offline? You know, us two go talk about this rather than you take it out on that. The whole reason that person was doing it was so the other person was shut up, right? That's not cooperation. That's not teamwork. That's bullying, you know? When it comes to culture, what you, incur what you permit, you actually encourage. If it's a negative thing and you allow it to happen without correction, you're complicit. Um, some other things, too. Uh, one thing I would uh, encourage you is to celebrate team successes. Look for any excuse, right? Even if it's something that's funny. Uh, years ago, and I, I do this now at Sequel Century, um, years ago we didn't have a budget for a holiday party. Uh, I scraped together. I decided to just throw a holiday party myself. And, 
And then uh, I gave everybody an award, just kind of actually based on our, our biggest, funniest flub of the year. I gave myself the punctuality award because I'm renowned for being late to things. And uh, you know, I gave other people awards for like the best code because that person never got past a, a code check, you know, without getting stopped and sent back. You know, so we had a great time with it. But by the end of the the you know the party, we were all laughing about it. And next year, people were wondering what award they were going to get. I was like, I didn't even know we were going to do this again. Uh, and we do this now where I'm at. Um, we just have fun with celebrating our team, right? Our personalities. And so there's always someone in our team who gets an award for walking into a, a fountain or a door while their cell phone is out, right? Whether your team is seen as fun-loving or not, that's up to you. That's up to your behaviors, right? Whether, you're, uh, whether your team is seen as allowing negative things to happen or not, it's up to you, okay? This, these cultures don't happen in a vacuum. And so another point to make about that is uh, a, a key remedy is to be very deliberate about what you do. Think about things before you do it. Model the behavior you want to see in others. If you don't want others to be late, be there early, start your meetings on time. That's how I started to remedy my problem was uh, there was a, a manager I had who knew was never there before 10 or 15 minutes after the meeting started. So what did the rest of the people on the team do? Well, they started coming 10 or 15 minutes late. And then they actually moved the meeting back to like quarter past. And then he started showing up, you know, 20 minutes late. And everybody said, and pretty soon people were like, oh, you know, it's half past and we're still not starting our meetings, right? It all flowed down from the, the way that person was modeling what's important across the team. Does that make sense? Anyone ever experienced that? See something similar to that? Yeah? Okay. I, I wish we had a little bit more time so you could tell me about some of your experiences too. Maybe, uh, maybe someone will get brave and decide to share a story with us. Yeah, be deliberate. Pl plan. Think about the, the culture you want your team to have because it is within your power to, to shape that. Yes? Okay. Yes. <laughs> so you got foam bricks, and everyone knew that it was open season if they came late to the, to the meeting at that point with these foam bricks. That's hilarious. We did one thing where we decided as a team we wanted to get better at pre presenting. And so um, we took a, a a cue from the Toastmasters who always uh, keep track of how much you say um in a presentation. And we're like, everybody bring the notebook that has like two pieces of paper left in it, tear them out and make them into paper balls. And when somebody says um, just throw it at them. Um, it was uh, <laughs> kind of stress relieving for some of us, uh, but it's fine, you know. We did get better as speakers, right? All right. Hey, you know, and, and again, the, but the whole fact that we did that kind of said that. Uh, Communicating well with others was an emphasis for us as a team, right? It kind of, those things don't happen by accident. You make decisions that uh, can, you know, can benefit the team and everyone will pursue that. All right, let's see if my clicker will work here. All right, this is again another one. I already mentioned how I'm, I'm nice. I like to be nice. I like to stay friends all the time. And it's hard to discipline. When, when there's something going wrong. It's hard to put in corrective actions when things are not going right. Um, so here's, here's the, the secret formula for correcting when things go wrong. First of all, immediate. When you see something uh, being done by someone on your team and you don't correct it, remember what happens on that the previous slide? If you permit something, you, you kind of encourage it, right? Um, the other thing is there's nothing fair in the world about finding out that you did something wrong on your annual performance review, right? It's like, how could I know that this was a problem and fix this problem in time for it to, you know, to not be counted against me on my performance review? You, you, what happened to the slide? The clicker went crazy here. All right. I'm going to leave that over here. Yeah, you know, so my, my natural inclination is, well, you know, if we don't fight, then maybe it'll, you know, it'll blow over, it'll get better. And in fact, uh, a lot of times what people uh, do is they actually assume that whatever, the, you know, when they yelled at that coworker, that was fine, right? It's okay if I do that. 
you know, some more um, balanced people will say, oh, you know, I should go and apologize, and they'll do it. But it, you can't assume that that will happen by itself. You know, there's, there's no guarantee about that. Um, another thing, like uh, I mentioned earlier, learning from bad bosses. So let me tell you how my first boss, when I worked for NASA, how he would correct people. He was a military person. And um, this was before email and before the internet, clearly, because email came before the internet. Sorry about that. Um, and so what he would do is he would hang out in the break room, um, and uh, if you came in, you know, he had a problem with you, he was going to correct you. If, if you came in to get some coffee and it was just you and him, he wouldn't say anything, let you go back to your desk. But uh, you came in and there was five or six people sitting at one of the tables, that's when he'd give you the cussing out, right? Because, you know, what good is yelling at someone unless you can really humiliate them, right? Because that's the only way they're going to learn not to do that again, right? Um, wow, that was a hard place to work, I'll tell you. It was the coolest work in the world, working for NASA, and the hardest place to work, um, in my experience. So there's definitely bad ways. Anyone know what the kind of, the, uh, you know, the little saying is about correction? Praise in public and? And criticize in private. So I would encourage you as a leader to, to, do, to follow that. If you've got something good to say, say it where everybody at that table can hear it. If you've got something uh, where you need to get them to change their behavior, do it privately. And again, to use uh, the remedy here, if this will do what it's supposed to, uh, there's more on this. In fact, uh, Joe Webb, who was speaking in here previously, does an awesome session on this. It's called Feedback as a Gift. And so there's um, a, a little bit more to it, and I also do a session as well on it. The real way to be successful when you have to correct someone in your team is to focus on behaviors and the outcome, not on traits. Okay, so here's an example. One of the people that was on my team in the past was a very academic person, uh, in the sense of very well schooled, very well educated, and that person was also um, liked things to be perfect. I can't imagine what it was like to live in that home, but um, I mean really perfect, really, really perfect, right? So we would do uh, database design sessions, and I would have um, different project owners come to me and say, Tina is taking forever with this design. And of course she was. She wants it to be perfect, right? And so her uh, coworkers would say, Tina, you know, you were, you know, you're so academic, you're so particular, this is killing us. And that wasn't the right way to correct her, because that kind of academic intellectual um, behavior was actually an aspect of her, her person, right? When, I, when somebody tells me, I need you, to, Kevin, to, to stop being such a jokester and stop kidding around a lot and stop being friendly and like trying to hug people. Oh, I'm a southerner, I, oh, I can stop hugging people, but I can't stop being friendly. That's part of who I am. And a lot of people say, I, I can't stop being who I am. But what you can do is you could say, this particular behavior of normalizing the fourth and fifth normal form when we really only ever need third normal form puts us behind on every single project you're involved with. Here's the behavior and here's the outcome. Not her trait that's built into her character of, you know, of really enjoying those intellectual exercises. We're not going to criticize that because people will not change who they are. But we can say, well, this behavior that you do is causing you know, us to lose credibility as a team. Do you want that to continue? Mm -hmm. I guess I can change that behavior somehow. It's like, great, let's start working on that. Because your designs are awesome, they, you know, they are perfect, they just take more time. Yes, question. Is it okay or acceptable to come to correction So is it okay if uh, corrections like that come from email and, and you know, associated things. A lot of times it is. It depends, it depends, right? It depends on the person. It depends on um, how big of a correction it is. Um, a lot of times if it's not a huge correction, it's just, uh, you know, some kind of operational thing, then a lot of times it's okay to say, you know, uh, it, it, we're off schedule for this and such reason. So how do you think we could alter that up? You know, change that up a little bit. Is there something you could change in the way you've approached this? that can help us meet those deadlines. And a lot of times they'll say, they'll volunteer that themselves. Uh, yes? Just real quick, um, if you have a conflict between two employees, do you recommend talking to each of them independently and working on it together? 
Yeah, so the question is if you have a conflict between two employees. Uh, well, first of all, I'm sorry, because that really is not a fun situation to be in. Um, and the first thing that you have to do is to, you know, to recognize that, uh, that it affects the entire team when that sort of thing happens. You do need to speak to each of them individually and get their perspective because, you know, if they say there's, there's your side of the story, there's my side of the story, and then there's the truth somewhere in between there, right? You can even, before you start to, to suggest or take corrective action, you could even talk to other people. Um, you know, we have multiple umpires on a, on a sporting field, right? Because sometimes that one didn't see what that one saw. So I would encourage you not just to talk to two people who are hassling with each other, but even other people involved too. Yeah, great question. All right. So this is one that we run into a lot. And it's not a mistake in the sense that it's going to ruin your career. But what I found that happens is when we're just working on the team, uh, and talking about, oh, yeah, you know, I'm, I've got this promotion. I lead a team now. What we forget about that when you're a middle manager, you're stuck in the middle. And there's people over you, above you. And that was, the, uh, uh, that was one of the funny things that happened to me uh, when I was kind of mentoring a, n a person who was a little younger than me becoming a manager for their first time. They're like, uh, she's like, I'm so glad I get to know all of what's going on and why these decisions are being made. And I was like, you don't know nothing about what this place is like, because none of us know what the hell's going on, right? It's like, maybe the CIO knows, but you know, once you're a middle manager, they don't share very much with you. You have all these responsibilities, but you have very few privileges, right? Um, so it's as important for you, as a, especially if you're a middle manager, maybe you're in a flat organization and you have a lot of authority, but in most organizations, you have someone you report to. And if your head is looking down, you're always working on your team, you might miss out on the most important thing in the world, which is what does your boss think of your performance, right? I have been in that situation many, many times uh, through my own fault where I'm working really hard on making my team more successful and you know, implementing all these great changes I'd envisioned. And I had never once talked to my boss to see if that change was something that they wanted to see happen that result set was something they wanted to see delivered. So I made that mistake a few times. After a while, I learned I need to spend as much time aligning with my boss's goal. I learned to ask this question. What does, it look, what does success look like for you? What do you get judged on? You know, how do you get a promotion? And once I learned what that was and actually would come in and say, hey, I was working on XYZ, which happens to be what you get promoted on, they're like, wow, you're doing a great job, right? Don't forget about that. Okay, and misunderstanding what motivi mo motivates a boss. I uh, tell a great story about uh, a person who attended one of my full day conference uh, or full day workshops on leadership, and uh, she, uh, many times she had tried to persuade her boss to ch completely change the way they did rollout of servers because they were judged on time to delivery. That was what they were judged on, and she wanted to implement all of these kind of fixes. Uh, scripts, run some scripts, setups for how the files were set up for better I.O. and preventative maintenance and all. The manager didn't want that at all because we are judged on how quickly those get deployed. Three times told no, we're not going to do this new thing that you want to do because it slows down how quickly these servers get deployed. And then she went back and uh, analyzed the situation after, you know, going into this kind of motivational discussion. And uh, she realized that this person was young and ambitious, one of the youngest managers at that level in the company. And one of the most important motivators for that, that particular ambitious person was to be seen as the hot shot, right, by other managers at that peer level. So the next time she decided to give it a try, she went to that manager and she, and she collected the evidence and she said, we've got to do something about this image problem we have. And the manager said, what are you talking about? And she said, well, we get, more, uh, we get more support requests than other departments that do administrative stuff, the SharePoint team, the email team. We get more support tickets. And the manager said, well, what can we do about it? She said, well, I have these scripts I'd like to roll, every, uh, roll out every time we put a new server into production and some things like He's like, let's do it now. What motivates your boss? A lot of times it's not rational, right? And so if you always, we're IT people. We approach them with rational suggestions, right? Here's the steps we could do to make this world a better place. So what? 
I don't care about the world as a better place, right? I care that I get a promotion, or I care that I get some bonus, or I care that, you know, the CIO makes me deputy CIO, right? You can't, you can't motivate irrational people with rational arguments. Know what motivates your boss. If they're in that irrational category, you've got to respond to that. All right, let's go a little quicker. Two main points I want to make here about communication. The first is you're communicating all the time, even when you say nothing. There are many important situations in which a re response is required, and I see us as new leaders saying, ah, I better not say anything. And that sends an enormous message to a lot of people, right? Either that you don't care, or that it's not important, or that uh, you know, you'll get to it someday, things like that. Another thing that happens, if you've ever been in an organization in which layoffs are happening and things like that, how much assurance do people have when management doesn't say anything about it? Everybody's kind of watching their job, right? Everybody's wondering if they're going to be laid off. People assume the worst. So think about that in terms of communication. Uh, another thing about communication, communicating poorly, that I want to point out is that we as IT people love our machines. And how many of us have been sitting in our cubicle with our coworkers two and three cubes down, and we have 45 emails for what could be a three-minute in-person discussion, <laughs> right? So recognize that there are certain kinds of communication that empower us, and they're useful in certain situations. Email is great, you know, when we have a, a team that's doing tons of telecommuting and stuff like that, and you know, we're not all in person together all the time. That's great, but sometimes, as a leader, you need to pick up the phone because people need to be able to hear your inflection, right? You need to come in in person, and people need to be able to see your face and say, I think you did an awesome job. I am really, really glad that you joined our team, right? You send that in an email, that feels, oh, that's nice. You say that in person to them, and they could be coast. I will coast on a, for a week on a nice compliment, right? Even if it's true, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. Another key thing that happens a lot is that we communicate to ourselves. I've seen really technical people like use lots of acronyms, and they're not really communicating to their listener. So think about your listener. What do they know? What's their world like? You try to tell your grandma about what you do at the day job, you're going to have a lot of trouble unless you think about how she thinks about the world, right? then you can actually communicate with her successfully. The crazy thing is, that, ex that example is easy to understand because there's an extreme difference between what our grandmas know about technology and what we know. But a lot of times, we're sitting next to another technologist, and it turns out that they don't have any idea what the heck we're talking about, right? So think about it from their point of view. Uh, it's one thing you'll see salespeople do all the time. You know, we're not, a lot of us aren't C-level managers, but a lot of, you know, CIOs or CTOs or CDOs or whatever, um, you know, they're big sports fans. So they'll tell all these sports analogies, salespeople will tell, use all these sports analogies all the time because they know that those people don't know what, um, you know, what an AG is and, you know, HA and DR and the, the CIO, like, you know, he's falling. He's like, well, we got to make sure that we can recover from a fumble. And he's like, oh, I got it. Yeah, okay. You know, <laughs> speak in the language that they understand, not the one you understand. Think about it ahead of time, okay? This is a huge one, one I struggled with a lot. Um, focusing on results, right? Again, I mentioned this before. Don't micromanage. If you do, I will tell you right now, you are losing your people. Tell them what needs to get done, but not how to do it. If they figure out something really, really clever, great. Praise them for it. If they do something in a way that you wouldn't do it, unless it's hurting them or the team, don't worry about it. Right? It didn't keep you up late at night, and that's OK. Right? My problem a lot of times is that I'm too hands off. I let people go out and figure out what they need to do, and I think that's, that's an appropriate response. But sometimes I should be checking up, making sure that they're on top of it, making sure that... So there's, there's mistakes you can make on, you know, on either side of that. Right? And then I already, already talked about these unpleasant behaviors. Sometimes we can have such an emphasis on re results that 
we're looking at just one person's results instead of what happens to the entire team. So if we allow someone to be disruptive in their productivity, then we can hurt, hurt everyone across the board. Okay? And again, um, remember that we are no longer judged by individual contributions. As, as a leader, as a manager of a team, we're judged by the aggregate results of the team. And that's one, time, uh, one thing I, I talk about my friends who are writing a lot of SQL code, because they'll use average to calculate you know, a, comp, uh, a, a number. And sometimes I say, well, what about median and mode? And they're like, what's median and mode? And I'm like, well, average, you know, let's say we've got three 100s, and then we have three 10s. So the total is 330, and we divide it by the number of occurrences, and that gives us 55 as our average number. But how often did 55 occur in that sequence of numbers? It never occurred once. Right? We did, our team didn't perform as a 55. We had one person who was 100, and we had a bunch of other people that were lower. Maybe we need to try and get everything closer to a consistent level of performance. Aggregate results, not individual specialized results. Another thing, too, about not focusing on results, and again, it goes along with this idea of the prima donna, is a lot of times people don't, uh, in general, People don't focus on the, the specifics. Like when you leave this room, it's very likely that if somebody said, what are some of the things you learned in that session? You might remember one or two things, but there's a much higher probability you will remember how I made you feel sitting in this classroom. You're like, oh, that was a great session. How come? What did you learn? You're like, well, I'll have to go back and read my notes, but it was great. Right? You ever done? My wife and I, our big thing is comedy, uh, live comedy. We go see live comics a lot. And we will leave there with sore stomachs, our favorite comedy club. And my wife will have streaks right through her makeup because she's been crying. She's been laughing at so hard. And we're like, that was great. What was that joke about? And she'll look at me and she's like, I know the one you mean. And I'm like, what was, what was the joke even about? And we're like, I don't know. But that comedian, we, we saw Louis C.K. two or three times, if you've ever seen him. Very funny comedian. We were laughing so hard, I thought I was going to have to take her to the ER. And we we're like seven minutes into the show. We we're like, what was that about? And we're like, I don't know. <laughs> we remember how people make us feel. Oftentimes, we lose the granular details. And so when we focus on results, it's the same kind of corollary. Management remembers how the team does. That's kind of like how we make each other feel. They don't remember the individual specific tiny things that you guys were way on it for this particular project. So think about that. That's why it's better to get consistently really good results instead of occasionally being spectacular and occasionally stinking. Right? You, want, you want a highly consistent, good experience throughout. Now this is one I don't think any of you will make because you're not that kind of person. But a lot of people, like I said in uh, the earlier joke, is like, well, I can't wait to become a leader now because once I'm officially in authority, I will know all the secrets that leaders know in this company. A lot of times, uh, the secret is that nobody knows anything, right? Or it's, uh, as you move up, you get revealed one do what's behind one door, and you don't know anything else. Or you're, you're thinking, oh, I can't wait to be a manager so I can finally you know, control the budget myself. And then you find out, this happened to me, um, you know, I, I can finally give promotions and raises to the people on my team because I have hired awesome people. And then I find out I can give to my entire team in aggregate 6% raise. Now, instead of something that was going to be great that I was expecting to be able to give everybody the appropriate raise and get them to the levels I wanted them to, what was consistent with the market, now I have to compromise either on everybody and give everybody a 1% you know, raise or I give the most valuable person, an appropriate, you know, don't forget, your authority will not be limitless. Unless you own the company, you will be constrained at every turn. And again, the other thing that um, I'm not really accusing anybody here, don't do it because you want to be in a position of authority. Do it because you want this team to be productive, because you want to be fulfilled by that kind of work, because it makes you feel good to get a group of people moving in the same direction and coordinating their efforts and doing things better than they ever could before. But if you're doing it because you want that name of director uh, on your business card, you might not be glad you made that choice later on. Okay. All right, we're almost done. Um, the, the remedy here, and I, I, kinda, I, I, I just want to reiterate it again, Think about that first slide that I th put up about autocratic leaders 
versus coaching leaders, right? Uh, the coaching leader kind of does things in consensus with others. And there's, there's almost a transactional nature of it. It's like uh, I remember when I was um, on a basketball team as a young person, and I was probably the worst person on the team. But I was also tall, young. You know, so for seventh graders to be as tall as I was, I had a very important role on the team, which was to intimidate the short guys on the other team. And, uh, but my, you know, there was this transactional nature, and so um, it worked really well when my coach said, I need you to practice free throws until you hit at least two in a row consistently. You can hit two in a row, right? That's not a really good shooting average, right? But there was a kind of transactional nature because I knew what I needed to do, and he hadn't put anything on me that I wasn't readily willing to agree to. It was, you know, consensual and transactional in that case. So that's, um, I've seen other leaders in the past do things like, they're like, well, we agreed to what your job was going to be, and uh, you're clearly off uh, target here. And the person says, you agreed to what my job was going to be, right? I was given this job definition, and I was told if I'd like to work here, this is what I got to do. Nobody asked me if I can do it. Uh, you know, if I'm capable of doing, you know, so it, it, have you ever been in a situation like that where you're kind of like handed your marching orders and you're like, sink or swim? I've seen that all the time, all the time, every day, every week. I, see, I seem to see that kind of thing where it's proposed to you as a false transaction. There's not a, there's not a true give and take in a situation like that. Good leaders try to find those situations where we can make it consensual, truly consensual, and they, they allow you to come back and say, that, this looks good, but you know, my skill set isn't really good for this particular bullet point on this list of three things. Can we change that? And a good coaching leader, like you are, will say, yeah, let's talk about that. What can we do to make that successful for both of us? OK. This was the biggest thing that I had to learn. So um, early in my career, I was a developer. And the thing that was good about that and kind of hid this mistake from me for six years as I was a developer and a leader of development teams, we had project plans. So I kind of clearly, I had a clear idea of what it would be for us to be successful, which was to de deliver on time and with as few bugs as possible, right? A project plan uh, for a dev team makes that pretty simple. But later on, I became a DBA and we had administrative teams but our only metric of success was that your servers don't crash, Kevin. Uh, and I was like, OK, great. Uh, now they don't crash. And so I spent a, quite a while after that, like, well, we're, we're kind of drifting along. What are we doing? Um, it, it was good, in a sense, because I didn't have a lot of pressure to, um, to create new goals or anything like that. But if you're, a lot of you raised your hands that you're a DBA, and maybe you're you know, your impression, your metric of team success is that your servers just don't crash, right? Uh, here's my suggestion to you in this situation, is that you create, we call them synthetic goals, okay? That is, these are not goals that management has put on us. Uh, uh, their goal, uh, uh, their success for us is that servers don't crash and that they perform well and that we don't beg for new hardware every year, right? <laughs> that was pretty much all it took for them to be happy with us. So we decided, you know what? We need to have some goals for us to stay motivated, to stay on top of this. So the first goal we made was just to learn what was normal for all of our servers. Because if you don't know what normal is, you can't know what truly is abnormal, right? So we just set out to start measuring you know, telemetry on all of our servers. What's the uptime? What's the transactions per second or batches per second? You know, what's, how much I.O. is being used? How is it being used? How much of our network uh, bandwidth is being used? And then from there, the next year, we made new goals. You know, let's make, uh, let's make better use of our servers. Let's make sure that we actually get a little bit more out of them. Can we consolidate some servers? Can we open up some servers for new, cool projects? And we actually did some things like that. We were able to reprovision some, uh, some um, databases. We had that policy of one database, one application, one server for a long time. Anyone know that story? Yeah. <laughs> See some people nodding their heads, yeah. So we actually found out, oh, this server's got enormous headroom. So we moved an app over there, and this server now became our DBA utility server. And we were like, wow, we are even better than we were before. So then we were able to build monitoring solutions in the next, next 12 months. And so we, you know, we were able to escalate from there and continue to make our team the best performing team in the IT center. 
it was really exceptional. And it all started with us making up our own goals. So if you don't have goals imposed on you that require tracking, create them. And gear them towards making you successful, improving your reputation, improving your credibility and visibility within the organization. Uh, another thing that we would do is we would report against it. You know, Peter um, Drucker, the you know, famous management guru, said, uh, you cannot manage what you do not measure. And I believe that's true. Like one of the things we did was we had trouble getting our management to pay for training. So when we finally got management to uh, pay for one of us to go to, it was actually TechEd, 1996, um, the person who went agreed to do uh, at least a one paragraph on every session that they attended. And, and what happened, though, was really cool. Um, they put that up, and we actually printed it out and handed it out to everyone. That was 1996. I mean, hell, hardly used email back then, you know? And, um, but here's what happened. First of all, management was finally assured that he wasn't sitting by the pool drinking margaritas that entri entire training uh, session. But the other thing was we started to uh, we started to talk about this stuff, and we started to share what we learned, and the team started to get better again. And management said, you know what? Now that I can see that the team is better, I'm a lot more likely to, in fact, they sent two people the next year, and then pretty soon we had four people going because now they knew that this wasn't just an investment in that one person. It was an investment in the whole team because they brought it back, and everyone learned from that, right? So report on things. Over-report on stuff you do. Tout your own successes, N not to brag, but to show how what you have done for me, manager, has led to your improved success. Because that manager probably knows that they are judged on the aggregate results of their teams, too. Right? All right. So, got to have that. Uh, you got to have those success criteria. Now, that's the top ten list. Let's talk about the gap. Okay. Um, there's a lot of study you can do, a lot of follow-up, um, you can dive deeper. And any of these sort of things, if you were to put quotes around these and put them into the Google, you will get lots of results. You know, there's lots of white papers, um, there's lots of good articles, blog posts, things like that. So if you were to say, visualize and meet team goals, you're going to, when is the last time you typed something in in Google and not gotten a result back? I want to know what it was you searched for that caused that to happen. But the, I, the thing is, I've, as I mentioned, I've already done a lot of research on this. And these are the kind of things that the management consultants and the training companies title their white papers. Okay? So if you want to learn more, just double quotes, facilitating good communications, boom. You will get lots of great articles that give you step-by-step -step stuff. Now, you can also go to um, uh, SlideShare, and I've got presentations on these things. Uh, our, my website that's for leadership skills for IT people is called For IT Pros. You can go there. There's a lot of stuff on this. All of those things will make you and your team a much better leader. But again, where are those independent contributor skills? You know, being the best C-sharp coder on the team or being the best uh, database designer on, on the team. It's not what's going to make you a great leader. Okay. All right. So let's wrap up. As I was saying at the very, very beginning of this, uh, this presentation, this isn't um, the sort of thing that is the top 10 mistakes are about your technical skills. They're interpersonal skills. And when you think about the projects that you've been a part of, they've gone off the rails because people weren't talking, they weren't sharing. Um, you know, people were mad at each other, some people were behaving badly, and they weren't getting corrected. It's, it's almost always a technology, um, it's not technology. Right? In fact, I like to say my, my, kind of by, uh, my kind of motto is that we don't actually even have technology problems. We have business and organizational problems that are solved by technology. Right? 300 years ago, they had the exact same problems. They just didn't have computers to solve those problems. So they figured out other ways to solve their problems. The Royal Navy of Great Britain, how did they solve their manpower problems? Pulleys, believe it or not. All those sailing ships that they built, 
hundreds and hundreds of pulleys, so they didn't have to have hundreds and hundreds of sailors on there, right? We do it the same way today, except we use PowerShell, right? <laughs> you know, we write these scripts that do all of that. All right. Same kind of thing. Now, just to wrap up, a couple uh, last resources for you here. First thing I want to say, please do an eval. If you found this session valuable, please, uh, please let pass know. I enjoy speaking at the conference and would like to be invited back. <laughs> so if you liked it, say so. If you didn't, feel free to say so. I encourage uh, uh, you know, any, any kind of feedback that you have. PASS has a VC, a virtual chapter, just for professional development. Get involved in that, right? Start learning about that. I mentioned four IT pros. There's also a really good kind of general website. You know, they talk about everything from you know, the latest iPhone to you know, team leadership. Uh, to, you know, big IBM mainframes, Tech Republic, and they have a section dedicated just to leading teams. It's a really good resource. And then let's get connected on uh, Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever you like to use, Twitter. Uh, send me an email, kekline at sequelcentury.com, and then there's my other links for uh, my blog, my slides, and that sort of stuff. All right. Any other questions before we wrap up? All right. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>